So I am Mark Williams. And I'm beginning to feel a little bit about, I, that I understand a bit about Kevin Bacon's life is like uh, six degrees of Mark Williams is what we've been experiencing this morning. Although I am looking forward to the rebranding of Genomic Medicine 4 as Mark Williams Genomic Medicine 4, which seems to be the direction that we're going. So. Um, Sean's question um, uh, to Eric was very timely for what I'm going to be talking about, and I don't have any slides uh, with this. Um, but uh, I was asked to give a summary of uh, uh, the dissemination and implementation uh, meeting, uh, the fifth annual uh, meeting um, that took place um, in Bethesda uh, a couple of months ago. Um, uh, there is a trans NIH effort in dissemination and implementation science, um, and there are a number of efforts that um, uh, take place. Uh, leads uh, for this are in the National uh, Cancer Institute and the National Institutes for Mental Health, um, and there are a number of other institutes that are uh, collaborating with this. And um, the annual meetings are one of the highlights uh, of this where people can get together and really talk about what they're doing in relation to uh, dissemination and implementation. And, and to give you an idea of the popularity of this, there were um, probably between seven and 800 attendees at this particular conference. And this is something where they, everybody comes on their own dime. Uh, so I think it really is, uh, shows the enthusiasm uh, for um, this. Uh, Francis Collins uh, opened the meeting uh, and described uh, the NIH's commitment uh, from the top uh, to dissemination and implementation. Um, Interestingly enough, there was one talk that did feature guitars, but in a shocking upset, it wasn't Francis's talk. So uh, uh, for those of you who know his predilection for bringing his guitar to these types of things, uh, he didn't actually this time. Uh, somebody else did. Um, the reason that it's relevant to the genomic medicine group and to the NHGRI is that um, uh, NHGRI actually sponsored uh, a workshop at this uh, meeting. This is the first time that uh, Genome sponsored a workshop at the dissemination implementation meeting. Uh, I organized the workshop and moderated the session. Um, all of the presentations that were at this uh, session were ones that have been uh, heard by this group before. So uh, Lori Orlando from uh, Duke uh, discussed her family history implementation uh, project. Uh, Dave Mrazek from the Mayo Clinic described his uh, psychiatric pharmacogenomic project, and uh, I talked about the Lynch syndrome implementation uh, project uh, that we had at Intermountain Healthcare. Uh, in our session, we had uh, about 70 attendees. Uh, there was excellent feedback, very good interactive uh, questions and answers. Uh, I haven't seen the full evaluation from the meeting, but uh, informally, uh, the reports were that the session uh, got very good uh, marks, uh, and there was good satisfaction. I also wanted to give you um, sort of my takeaways from the meeting as a whole, uh, things that I uh, noticed and that I thought would be relevant. Um, I actually commented to the meeting organizers, and I was one of the people on the planning committee. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, and I, I'm, I, I'm, to my knowledge, I'm still on the planning committee, although after my comments, perhaps that will be reassessed. But um, I thought that there was a real imbalance uh, in terms of the actual study of the science of dissemination and implementation, which is really important, related to, uh, to the actual presentation of successful projects. Uh, in uh, medical care for dissemination and implementation. So there was a lot of policy, there was a lot of um, uh, other things of that nature, um, uh, particularly in the keynotes, that um, while interesting, uh, I must admit I was expecting much more, um, uh, you know, a, a many more presentations about the success of implementation and the strategies that were used that were successful so that we could uh, take those away. There was one notable exception uh, to that, which is a colleague of Jeff Ginsburg's from Duke, who gave a spectacular talk on the use of social media in research that was just unbelievable. And I think that's something that would be fascinating to have this group hear about, uh, because it's, it, it really opened my eyes to what an untapped uh, potential uh, this has uh, to facilitate our research. But uh, in particular, and maybe this is something that we can um, uh, tee up back to the uh, clinic uh, research interface um, uh, group, uh, because it was, uh, it was fascinating to me. Th the current way that we do research and how we consent research almost never um, would accommodate uh, social 
uh, networking to really facilitate research uh, because of the of the restrictions. And the t slide that was most telling was the uh, uh, randomized control trial um, that uh, he had done, where he showed the intervention on one side using social media, and that stayed static. And on the other side, during the course of the 18 months of the trial, he just in, a, in an animation ran through all of the updates to all the social media that had been taking place in that time. And it went on for two minutes, just this constant list that you couldn't even read because it was scrolling by so fast. And it shows just how rapidly adaptable social media are and how we're completely incapable in a research setting where we have to fix things in cement to study them. Uh, so it raises some really interesting questions about how we can kind of uh, uh, reconcile those, those two worlds. So that's something that I thought uh, was, uh, was sort of the highlight of the meeting for me and, and uh, something that I'm interested in thinking a lot more about. The other thing related to imbalance is when I actually they showed a slide of the planning committee and as I actually looked at the names and the titles, which uh, I hadn't before, uh, out of the 20 on the planning committee, there were only two MDs, um, um, me being one of them. And I, again, I think that may be contributing to some of the imbalance, and I pointed that out uh, to the organizers as well. Now, I think there is tremendous value to uh, NHGRI and to our particular group uh, to be able to get our work out in front of this uh, type of uh, audience and in this venue. So I have made recommendations to Terry and Eric uh, that NHGRI uh, continued to fund a workshop for the 2013 uh, meeting. Uh, to my knowledge, there hasn't been a, an official decision as of yet, but I'm now putting it out into the public to really put a lot of pressure on them uh, to do that. So for those of you who agree with me, then please uh, uh, harangue them at the break. Um, and I think that this is the group that we would look to to say, um, you know, where, where are the presentations that we think are really exciting that show how this can be done uh, that we can take into this venue. So I would really look at this group as being the uh, opportunity uh, to identify those uh, great things that we want to show off. Um, now, one additional reminder since there's been a lot of talk about funding opportunities, and that is that the dissemination and implementation uh, group uh, does have a funding mechanism uh, through the Common Fund using a PAR uh, mechanism. And so if you go to uh, NIH website, uh, enter Dissemination Implementation, uh, you'll see the three funding opportunities that they have. And I think that um, they're very open to the idea of um, being able to have um, projects in this space. Uh, that would be available for funding, and uh, I think they would look very different. So as opposed to, you know, competing with the usual suspects in uh, the RFAs that we've just kind of heard about, uh, in some ways I think, if, particularly if you have something that's very innovative uh, that you think may not stand up as well against uh, more established um, uh, types of uh, programs, this may be a mechanism to explore. And if any of you have any um, uh, need any direction to that, just uh, uh, shoot me an email and I'll be happy to kind of point you in the direction for those. So that's uh, really all I have to say. I'm happy to answer any questions about that. Sean. Well, th this is <clears throat> maybe a question I should have asked Eric, but I, I woke up slowly this morning. <laughs> so, uh, but I think you might be a, a good person to comment on it as well. Um, you know, I was thinking back to those sort of, um, I don't know what you would call those scatter plots or something that showed heat for the, map, the heat map. I think as we officially. Uh, the, Eric's the, shaking his head no. You don't like heat map. It's not a heat map. It's actually a density plot. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have clarification of that in the final minutes. Good. And, um, you know, the, at least the way I read it, uh, <laughs> whatever it was, the, that the sort of, was sort of in 2020 where that really, you know, started to be some emphasis in that, you know, fifth domain. Um, but it, it was just striking me as you were talking that, you know, the, the, <laughs> the way this field is emerging, you know, there's already rapid, you know, uptake in sort of clinical use as well as, you know, reimbursement and so, and, you know, kind of all these programs that are already taking the technology and implementing it and using it in clinical care. And it seems like Maybe it's a little too slow to be thinking so not ser more seriously about, you know, the evaluating the effectiveness or whatever that fifth domain was yeah. called, when you've you've kind of unleashed the monster, if you will, or whatever, <laughs> whatever would be a bit more appropriate metaphor. You know, it kind of it, it's happening now, so it seems like you're going to be, 
you know, six or eight years behind if you if the if the program. Mo so I don't know if you have. Yeah, well, I'll make on. a couple of comments, and I'm I'm sure Eric will will comment as well. I, I mean, the first thing I would say is that it, it, even though the bulk of the effort uh, is represented, you know, towards the uh, latter part of that ten years, the reality is is that there are. Um, uh, represented efforts uh, in that area that I think are um, uh, reflecting early adopters and that type of thing. The second thing I would say, and, and I think this is what Eric was trying to say, is that, you know, um, Eric did not come off the mountain uh, with this on stone tablets. Uh, that this was the best um, shot based on the in, uh, on the information uh, from the meeting in terms of representing that. But this is a very dynamic uh, thing. And if priorities need to be reorganized based on what's actually happening, I think that the uh, genome ha they're, they're not going to go back to that and say, well, sorry, um, you know, we said that was 2019 and so we're not going to respond to the fact. I don't think uh, that their intent is to let um, the practice get out ahead of uh, of what they're interested in doing, I think it's just it's it's a it's a reasonable um, reflection of what the thinking was two years ago, and I my, my guess would be is that if you re-represented that today, it would probably look somewhat different than uh, than it is. So I don't know, Eric, do you want to comment? Well, uh, if, I'm not sure I came down from a mountain, but if I did, I came with PowerPoint, not with stone <laughs> tablets for sure. Um, <laughs> But, I, I mean, I, I guess one of the things I say, I want people here to speak up because every time I hear somebody make a statement like we're already doing it now or it's already ready for comparative effectiveness investigations, there are usually plenty of people that speak up and say that's not true, that, that you're, you're overstating the current situation and, and that you're being overly optimistic. I don't know if anyone wants to bite on that, but, I mean, certainly I, I hear plenty of, uh, lots of skepticism. If they're not in this room, I could name people um, who are influential members of the community who skepticism about whether we really are here or now at that stage. Um, that said, I'm open-minded. I mean, and that's, we, but, I, but to the notion that we are, way behind on thinking about uh, effectiveness evaluations of genomic medicine. I, I guess I can't believe we're way behind. It's a matter of whether we're within striking distance or not. I don't know. Jeff, do you want to comment? Well, I would just say, um, Jeff Ginsburg, uh, that um, if I understood Sean's comment, it's that there are places where um, clinicians are using genetic and genomic tools routinely, and can we find, w find those places and capture the data that would help us evaluate the evidence, I mean, as one, as one strategy here. So we shouldn't ignore the fact that it's, you know, that, it, some, that the, the lion's share might happen 10 years from now, but in the, in, this, in the small enclaves that are doing it today, let's take full advantage of that um, so that we understand uh, how they've done it and whether it's valuable. And, and one of the questions I frequently get is the, when the, the, these examples, are they anecdotal? Are they truly clinical practice? Or are they still within the realm of clinical research? And if they're still in the realm of clinical research, we're really in a situation to study their relative effectiveness. I mean, when, what's that threshold? I, I mean, again, I hear these debates at many meetings. I'm just curious what your thoughts well, are on that. I mean, unless I'm, unless I'm misinterpreting what I've heard some people describe, it seems like, you know, more and more ac clinical academic institutions are setting up you know, genomics programs that are, you know, advertised in glossy brochures and, you know, are kind of luring folks in with the, you know, the sexy terms of personalized medicine and, you know, some of those, some of those clinical applications I think are fairly well, you know, demonstrated. A lot of it they're pretty clear on is, you know, needs to be further evaluated. But I, I think your point about, you know, is it or is it not ready for comparative effectiveness research? Well, it may or may not be, but it certainly appears to be. <laughs> you know, being actively and aggressively adopted and, and uh, you know, Joanne and, and Naomi can maybe speak to, you know, maybe, maybe Joanne particularly that, you know, the, the, the bills are certainly piling up whether or not the evidence is there. And uh, so that would suggest that it probably is time to look at it from a clinical utility comparative effectiveness point of view in a more serious way. But, uh, you know, that's. Yeah, uh, I, I, this is Joanne Armstrong from Aetna. Um, yeah, I would second that. I think the question is whether you're talking about, you know, the demonstration of effectiveness of genetics as a big field, or of course not, or these specific examples. Some of these examples, you know, we, we see our own data. They are well integrated. The utilization is high. Um, some of them have some studies of effectiveness behind them. Some of them don't. So, you know, to that density plot, I think there are some leading edge examples that it would be valuable to get the data if not, uh, on effectiveness. If nothing else, it would 
drive some enthusiasm for broader expansion and the attention of organizations to pay attention uh, to this field. So, um, are, are we going to hear uh, the, the, the specific examples in some of the upcoming talks? Is that today? I mean, I'm just looking ahead. Well, I have some data on, um, yes, I do have some Aetna data on a number of things, including Great. some of the technologies that are covered. It, it was quite amazing to me that the last time I updated two of our slot, two of the slides that I use on pharmacogenetics, the examples of what's covered. I think there are about six things on the slide. Today there are, you know, for today I have two very dense slides that just look at the biomarkers. So um, there is a lot of activity, and it's it's fascinating because you're the the picture you showed of some people walking slowly and some sort of fast walking. Um, it occurred to me that I was sort of somewhere between walking slowly and fast walking, as I was personally thinking about it, but when I put the slides together, it's like, hmm, it's definitely fast walking, <laughs> not running, um, but it, it's here. So can I, can I, without putting you on the spot, but is it possible for us to actually somehow see the data? I, I mean, is this data publicly available on the frequency in which uh, genetic testing is being done within your respective companies? Is that something that we could, well, we, could, um, we could share? Yes. I don't know if Reed Tuxin is here yet, um, but United just published a uh, white paper, and mm -hmm. you know, it's odd for Aetna to be talking about what United just published, where they, they look at um, and make available the utilization of genetics by condition. I have some of that data myself uh, to show you also by population types of, of people getting it. Um, there are lots of challenges in the data, and I'll show that to you. Um, and a lot of it is related to the stack coding, so that you know when you look in a claim system to try to understand utilization and what tests are being used. Now it's all, you know, the stacks. Um, but that is changing. 2013, uh, the molecular pathology codes will change, so there will be greater specificity. Uh, some of them have changed today, so we've changed the BRCA codes by themselves. And then once we have that, I think we're going to have a very good view of how much of it is being done, for what conditions, what specific tests are being used. And then you can use that for research purposes, for reimbursement purposes, a whole, whole host of things. So that's happening One quickly. of the reasons why that's so useful, I think, is my opinion, it's, it's going to be so useful for us to know those specific examples is to then trace, I think, one of them, is to sort of trace back on, on uh, is it sort of knowledge that just sort of just came on the scene, or is it knowledge that came on the scene 20 years ago and now is just sort of getting to that stage? Because what we're trying to do is project things that are going on now in some of our discovery programs and some of our clinical exploratory programs, and then trying to imagine, are they going to sort of hit your list two years from now, you know, five years from now, or is it 10 years? And again, it's, it's all this just, if we, if we knew that, we would be able to just sort of design research programs to study it, and we just don't know how, how quickly we have to do that. Right. So, where there's, right, so where there's specific coding, you can do that, and there's specific coding for the oncotypes and the BRCAs of the world, but for most of the other tests, there's not. So what I'm just saying, these codes will change in 2003, January 2013 is when the new coding system will be adopted, and I think that's going to give you a lot of transparency into what's going on. Do you have, so it, by, do you have it by specialty? So, so I, I'm just going to, uh, uh, as part of the planning committee, I'm just going to interrupt what is a great discussion, but premature, uh, in the sense that I think we've already accomplished our first goal from the last meeting, which was to uh, bring together people that actually uh, understand from uh, different perspectives to this group uh, to be able to um, uh, 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 engender exactly this type of dialogue. And so I think that um, uh, it will probably be better place to hear some of the formal presentations and then react off of those, because I suspect that uh, some of the questions that we have bubbling up are going to be answered in those presentations. So, um, but with a heavy editorial hand, I'll just do it. Um, we're at the, uh, about at the end of my time, I saw Irwin with a hand up and Pearl with a hand up. Pearl's okay. Irwin, do you have something specific, not to get into the weeds, but uh, broader related specifically to dissemination and implementation? Yes, I do. Um, and uh, so I'm particularly interested in your comments that uh, about the impact of social media and, you know, very clearly from talking to some players in this field in New York, uh, uh, you know, this is an avalanche that's coming and that's sort of into the areas that are now termed like patients like me or patients like this and sharing uh, data in a whole different way. Uh, however, the underlying commodity of all this uh, uh, this market is data uh, and uh, you know it's not a person's health or creation of knowledge 
and I think there may be a particular conflict that we need to deal with. I'm wondering whether this is something uh, that could be taken up by the cl uh, clinical and research interface or in some work group sooner rather than later, because it is it is on the on the on the agenda of many discussions that we are having. You know how to bring s social media into into this space, and it's coming certainly to genomic medicine sooner mm -hmm. uh, than we expect. Yeah. Well, I think that it's certainly something, and I see uh, Pearl shaking her head as as the new chair of that uh, uh, group. That I think that in our uh, breakout tonight, um, I, I hadn't thought about this until I got up here and started talking about it, and said, "Hey, that would be a good idea." Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what usually happens to me. I, I don't take showers, so uh, <laughs> I don't have any ideas there. Uh, but uh, which is why <laughs> Heidi and. Uh, moving away. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I think we will take that up and, and look at s as to what we might be able to do in terms of perhaps exploring that. Maybe the first thing to do would be to do sort of a, a, an informing session to kind of uh, maybe propose uh, for Genome 4 that we maybe have a little session on, on this and bring in some people that are really exploiting this. Um, so I think there's some things to talk about. I agree with you, and, and I'd like to see that happen. Mm -hmm.